We begin with our conversation with George Mitchell, recorded on Thursday morning last week in London. There are two great political issues of debate here in Great Britain. One, of course, is Europe. The other is Ireland. For many years, ceasefire was the only kind of peace known in Northern Ireland. As negotiators resumed this fall, there is new hope for the future of the troubled region. In September, for the first time in history, Sinn Féin and Ulster Unionist leaders sat down to face-to-face -face negotiations. In October, Tony Blair became the first British Prime Minister to shake hands with the Sinn Féin leader in 76 years. Behind this breakthrough is former Senate Majority Leader and Chairman of the Independent Council for Peace, George Mitchell. Overseeing the process, he hopes to lead the parties to an agreement by the deadline set by Tony Blair, May 1st, 1998. I am pleased to have back at our table former Senator George Mitchell. Welcome. Thank you, Charlie. It's good to uh, see you. I, I, I want to talk about the negotiations first, but why are you doing this? <laughs> <laughs> I've asked that a lot. Uh, sometimes I wonder myself. Let me just set uh, the stage. Uh, I mean, you had an opportunity to do, go to the Supreme Court. You had an opportunity, uh, to, if things had gotten right, to be baseball commissioner. You could have done a lot of things. Right. Your wife is in New York with your new baby. Right. Um, you were prepared to experience the great life of leaving the Senate on your own terms uh, at the highest level, the most honored position in the Senate, and you're now here spending your nights in hotels and your long days negotiating with people who have been negotiating with each other for a long, long time. So why is George Mitchell here? Uh, two reasons. Uh, first, completely by accident. Yeah. I didn't intend this. I didn't seek it. I didn't expect it. I've gotten involved little by little, more and more. Now I find myself in a position where maybe in a small way I can be of help in resolving a conflict with centuries in age and violence and death and destruction. Uh, and that's a meaningful thing, the chance to be of help. Uh, I told my friends in the States, many of whom asked me exactly the same question, I've been very lucky in my life. My mother was an immigrant, my father the orphan son of immigrants, they had no education. I was helped by a lot of people at many places along the way in my life, and I was able to become majority leader of the Senate. Now, by destiny or fate or some unusual set of circumstances, I'm in a position to be of help to others, uh, and I can't turn down the challenge or the opportunity. It's very meaningful. I think we have a real chance to bring to an end uh, an historic conflict and let the people there turn a new page. Where are we? Further than we've ever been before, uh, right now, for the first time in the history of Northern Ireland, the first time ever, there is in place at the same time a general ceasefire and genuine peace negotiations. In the past, there's been one or the other at times, but never both at the same time. Very difficult, long way to go because the parties are far apart. But as you pointed out in your opening statement, they're talking. Uh, they're genuinely exchanging views, and in an extremely difficult circumstance for these political leaders, they're trying very hard to bring about an agreement that can command the allegiance of both communities in Northern Ireland and can bring about the kind of peace and political stability and reconciliation that almost all of the people there are desperate for. What change have you seen since you've been on the job? A dramatic change. Uh, the people have now come to experience the benefits of peace and political stability. They had lived for 25 years with violence, fear, anxiety, a terrible gloom that enveloped that society like an unyielding fog. That's been lifted now, and people see the benefits of peace. Greater exchange, greater commerce, greater prosperity, greater freedom, and most of all, freedom from fear. A mother now who sees her child out the door to go to school doesn't have to worry that perhaps that child is going to walk by a car that will blow up and that child will be lost forever. A person walking down the street doesn't have to be concerned that if he is a Catholic and a Protestant were killed uh, by some terrorists earlier in the day in another part of town just by random because of his religion, he might be shot in retaliation. That kind of fear has been lifted and it affected all of the community. They, they've had a terrible time. I think they want to continue. Now, they have deep differences, deep mistrust, even hatred, but they want to compose their differences in a peaceful way. Where do they have to go? What's the last mile that you have to take them? What is it, the breakthrough that you've got to get them to come to grips with? Because you're already there preaching the notion that violence is no way to settle this uh, and that everybody loses. And if you don't talk, 
nobody will gain. But just talk is gets you there, but what is it they have to say to go the last mile? Well, the first point to be made is that the decisions involving the future of the people of Northern Ireland must be made by the people of Northern Ireland themselves and their political leaders. Not by me, not by President Clinton, not by any American or any outsider. We have to understand that our role is to help, encourage, support, facilitate the circumstances in which they can compose their own differences, but it is not for us to tell them what kind of agreement they can reach. However, it is quite clear that a compromise is possible, that seemingly irreconcilable positions can be reconciled if there is some spirit of progress, of compromise, of willingness to move for the common good there. And that's really what they need. They need to say, look, here's what I want, here's what you want. Isn't there some way we can find a formula to give us both part of what we want? I think they can. But, but explain to me where that might be, because, I mean, if I am, if I am a Protestant and a Unionist, I am saying I don't want to be part ever of the Republic of Ireland. Right. That's not where I want to be. Now, you may change my relationship with Great Britain, but I don't want to be part of the Republic of Ireland. And the Catholics are saying, we're Irish. That's what we are. We're Irish. Right. And, and where do you find, I mean, what's, what's the formula that gets you past that? Well, the first and most important point. And one is a majority and one is a minority. That's right. The first and most important point is that the governments of Britain and Ireland and the United States support the principle that there can be no change in the current constitutional status of Northern Ireland without the consent of the people of Northern Ireland. Any agreement reached by the parties will not be self-executing. It won't take effect immediately. It must be approved in a democratic referendum by the vote of the people of Northern Ireland themselves. Most commentators believe, most analysts and experts believe and have said that since 60% of the population is Protestant and wants to remain part of the Union, approximately 40% Catholic, that it is unlikely that there will be a change in that status Ever vote because for the voters won't approve change. it. They'll a never constitutional, vote for a constitutional change. change if you look at the majorities that are on the face of that, the politics. Uh, on the face of it, right. But does that mean that nothing else is possible? Well, the, the talks that were in uh, are organized on three what they call strands, what we would call in American politics, three subcommittees or subgroups. One of them deals with what kind of government Northern Ireland would have if an agreement is reached. Right now, there is no local government in the sense of a state of a, of a uh, Northern Ireland wide government. It's done from here in London by the British government and has been for nearly about 25 years. That has to be power sharing. Catholics have to feel that they have a real say in the governance of their lives, something that they contend they did not have in the early years mm -hmm. of the Northern Ireland government. Secondly, the second strand is relations between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. The, the, for many years, there was a barrier at the boundary. Little commerce, uh, 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 little uh, travel between the two. That's changing to the good, for the benefit of both. Mm -hmm. Greater tourism, uh, what common interest do they have uh, in all kinds, environment, tourism, agriculture, uh, uh, indus industrial development, things of that type. And the third, and perhaps in the long run the most significant, although it gets the least publicity, is what they call East-West, Britain and Ireland. Uh, after many years of hostility, after a very long and painful history, the European experiment that you mentioned earlier is one of the dominant themes in British politics is really bringing them back together again. They are finding a common interest in Europe, and they are now cooperating in ways that would have been unthinkable 10 or 20 years ago. And so an agreement that involves all three of these, that involves some give and take on both sides, I think will be good for the people of Northern Ireland, the United Kingdom, and the Republic of Ireland, and can be achieved by these yeah, You have to buy into the idea, both parties do, that there's something to be gained from being part of a larger thing than there is fighting over our own deeply felt differences. Uh, I've preached that for two and a half years in Northern Ireland, that Violence, or the threat of violence, to resolve political differences is both morally wrong and counterproductive. What do you say to them to get them to give up the fact that their sons and their daughters and their wives and their husbands have shed their blood uh, to believe in something down the road that they have not ever seen? 
if the entire focus is to be on the past, then the future will be the past. And no one can want that. They have to remember the past. They have to honor those who went before them. But at some point, they must look to the future. They must break the bonds of history and say, we treasure what others have done. We are proud of our heritage. But we've got to have peace and political stability and reconciliation. And every single grievance of the past cannot be redressed. It's one of the major problems to moving forward. It is in all societies. It is especially so there. This is a very literate society, a higher rate of literacy than the United States. These are tremendously intelligent, articulate, productive people. And they know their history. They live their history to a degree that I think most Americans would find astonishing. They sing their and, history. Yeah, yes. and, and in a sense, it's a good thing, but it yeah. can also bind you in chains, and at some point you have to look to the future. I, I must say, Charlie, as an American, one of the great things about our country and our people is most Americans, you say, here's a problem. They say, okay, what do we do to solve it? Yeah. And, and that's kind of the spirit that has to be infused a little bit here to say, look, we've got a problem. We've got to deal with it. We've got to look to the future. That's what I try to emphasize. Does the fact that you have a new party looking for new beginnings in Great Britain make a difference? It does. Great credit must go to Prime Minister Major, who is the former Prime Minister of Great Britain, who really took a tremendous personal interest in this and who led the way in many respects to moving closer to cooperation with the government of Ireland in getting this process started and getting it off the ground. In came Blair for reasons unrelated to Northern Ireland because they didn't disagree on that policy. And he has brought his own special emphasis, tremendous energy. He's got a very energetic and dedicated Secretary of State for Northern Ireland Mo Molum, who on you, will be talk, you. you will be talking to. And they've done a terrific job in kind of giving it a jump start and moving it forward, taking steps that no previous prime minister has taken, and setting a deadline. Next May 1st, he's told them, we're going to finish this by then. Uh, I think he's been tremendously helpful to the process. Does it make a difference that the president of the United States came to Ireland, that the <clears throat> first lady of the United States came to Northern Ireland? It makes a great difference. Does it, uh, to say we care? To say we care, uh, the American involvement cannot be underestimated, and especially the president's personal interest. He is the first and only American president ever to have visited Northern Ireland while in office. Mrs. Clinton came again on a second visit just a couple of weeks ago. They're very, very interested in the problem. That makes a difference. It makes an economic difference. Trade and investment with the United States is a huge factor in Ireland, north and south. And the American involvement and concern about the peace process has been an important underpinning to what's going How on. How many times do you cite the fact that, that, look, if they can do it in South Africa, if they can get on the, on the road, notwithstanding all the impediments in the Middle East, we can do it here? Uh, I say it often, and I also say the following. Just imagine what this society could be if all of the effort all of the energy, all of the resources, and all of the blood that had gone to destructive purposes over the past half century were in the next half century put to the productive purposes of building a better society. In the end, is the process of negotiating, <laughs> you said to me as we sat down, these people <laughs> make the Senate look like. <laughs> they make the Senate look fast. I, I, before I got involved in this process, I thought the United States Senate was the was slowest, the slowest moving tedious. organization <laughs> in all the world. Yeah. Uh, but I found that it's a fast mo <laughs> moving it's punch compared to this dealing process. Dealing with Robert Dole was a snap yeah. compared I, to this. Uh, Bob Dole and I, of course, are uh, partners in the same law firm now in Washington. He's a good friend. We. We, we <laughs> got along very well when I was majority leader and he was minority leader for six years. But I told him recently, I said, listen, I used to think you were tough. <laughs> now I met these guys. I said, you were you easy. Were a <laughs> piece <laughs> of cake. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, it is tough because uh, they, they haven't done this before. Yeah. This is a new experience. Here's my question. In, in the end, 
I mean, I read where there are divisions within the IRA, and they're not happy with, with Jen Thain, and somebody accepts the Mitchell principles and somebody doesn't. All these little things, everybody has a reason not to go forward. In the end, when you're doing what you're doing, is it more a question of sort of confidence and trust than it is a piece of paper? Or is it, in the end, you got to get it every little thing crossed and every little thing dotted? It's both. Uh, more the latter than the former. They don't trust each other, and it is unlikely that the degree of trust needed is going to be built up over the matter of weeks. But there's a minimum level of trust that you need to make this work. But then it is making certain that the agreement is fair and reflects the interests of both communities. But when I hear you say that, I mean, I look at what happened to the Dayton Accords. Mm. Stop the war, but Look at what's going on over there yeah. in terms of how tenuous it is. It, it, and it will be tenuous for a long time to come because, as you pointed out, there are distant groups on both sides. There are people who are trying to continue to use violence to destroy this process, to destroy confidence Because and trust. they have no interest in a settlement that is anything other than what they want. 100% purity. You do it my way or we don't do it at all. And, of course, that's a prescription for endless conflict. That's a prescription for a society doomed to fear and anxiety and uh, what I think is way short of its, of its possibilities and its prospects. But I, I'll tell you, Charlie, it is possible because the principal overriding factor is the overwhelming majority of the people of Northern Ireland, Catholic and Protestant alike, across all sectors of the society, don't want to go back to the bitterness and violence of the past. Then are the negotiators and the leadership of both sides out of touch with the people they represent? No, they're not. Because interestingly, as in the United States, people want the issues resolved peacefully, but they want them resolved their way. And the question is, how do leaders take the steps mm -hmm. necessary, even the risks, to say to the people, we're going to take a step for peace because in the end, we'll all be better off. I think it can be done. It takes great courage. These are political leaders in a very difficult circumstance. Many of them have been shot at. They've been bombed. They've been arrested for uh, committing violent crimes. They've had very tough lives, and they're in a tough political circumstance now. But the prize is so great, peace and political stability, reconciliation. And economic rewards and, and being part of Europe and all of that. And being part of Europe and getting self-governance for themselves. They haven't governed themselves for 25 years. They've been governed from here in London. It's as though the state of California will run out of Washington. What would people in California think about that? They wouldn't like it very much. I think there's a great opportunity here, and I think they're going to seize it. Now, no one can predict the future with certainty, especially in a place like Northern Ireland. Unpredictable, scarred by history, but I think it's going to be done, and it's what keeps me going. Well, and you think it's possible. Oh, I think it's not only possible, I believe it will Probable. be done. Probable. And it will be done will by be May 1988? I hope so, because I want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Two last questions. What's the hardest thing about it? It is getting them, as you said earlier, to forget for a moment the history or be judged to repeat it as... Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's to, focus, to focus on the future and to try to break the bonds of the past. If you are successful and if the people are successful, this is the most important thing you've ever done in your life. I've been asked that a lot. Uh, I felt what I did as majority leader was important, a lot of important legislation. Yeah. I was a principal author of the Clean Air Act, uh, had a hand in a lot of major things that happened in our country, uh, and I like to think that was important. Uh, uh, right now, I'm thinking, Charlie, my four-week-old <laughs> son is the most important thing I've ever done. But it will be significant, uh, and, and it'll give me a good feeling, because I, I, I've been at this now for two and a half years. I've really come to know, admire, and like the people of Northern Ireland. Uh -huh. They deserve better. I'll just tell you this one thing. On the day my son was born, October 16, 1997, 61 babies were born in Northern Ireland. And I said in a speech to a group of young people in Northern Ireland two weeks ago, shouldn't those 61 children have the same chance to succeed in life that I hope my son will have? And that can only be if they rid themselves of the legacy of violence that's so dominated their society and get to peace 
and reconciliation, and I think prosperity. Mm -hmm. George Mitchell, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Pleasure Joe. to see you. My pleasure. Right. We'll be right back from London. <clears throat> Stay with us.